Dr. Pitovich is a uh, graduate of the uh, Northeastern Ohio University. He did his internship and residency at Mercy Hospital, and at one point he was the chief resident. When he did his residency, Dr. Luparella had already retired, but he would come back and volunteer and do some rounds so that, indeed, uh, Dr. Pinovich was touched by Dr. Luparella on some of those rounds. He subsequently, after finishing his residency, did a fellowship in nephrology at Stanford University. He has an MBA from the University of Massachusetts. He's the chairman of the Department of Nephrology at Mercy Hospital. He is also the vice president of medical affairs for Mercy UPMC. But most importantly, he oversees and is the director of the training program of internal medicine at Mercy Hospital. So he took over where others and Dr. Lou Perello left off. So, you know, I give you Dr. Pinovich and I tell you about all of his titles and his responsibilities, but let me tell you who this guy really is. In the not so far past, I had an opportunity to actually follow him along and go on teaching rounds with his residents. And I saw the same zeal and zest and vigor in his eyes that Dr. Lou Perello had. So I knew that he too was touched by the loop and he continues on with that legacy. So having said that, I'll bring Dr. Pinovich uh, to the podium. So good evening everyone. Um, tremendous lecture hall we're all in tonight. I'd like the focus of our discussion and your attention to be on the man himself, Dr. Luparello. I'm going to be saying a few words about my interactions with him and uh, the impact that he made on me and uh, many others. And, uh, you know, want to convey to you that it's really an honor to speak here tonight. Uh, thanks very much to the St. Vincent family for having me here tonight. Um, it's also an honor to speak in front of Dr. Luparello's brother, Jim, and his nephew, Vincent. We're so pleased uh, that they're here uh, with us uh, tonight. Um, I had one comment about what Angelo said. Uh, you mentioned death by a thousand razor cuts, and you know, maybe that was in the early days, uh, Angelo, but by the time I got there, it was death by a thousand switchblades. So something changed between one and the other, but uh, they were deep switchblades sometimes, but you remembered them and you, uh, the medical lesson was definitely taken home uh, from those interactions. So I'm gonna keep my comments fairly brief tonight. I wanna focus mainly, uh, the focus mainly to be on Dr. Luparello himself, uh, as it should be, uh, in the context of medical education in the present day uh, versus in the past. So Dr. Luparello began at Mercy in 1954. Uh, he subsequently went on to take a fairly nondescript residency program and then molded it to become among the pre premier internal medicine programs in the region. And as word got out about the quality of medical training at Mercy, a significant number of excellent physicians were attracted to join Dr. Luparello as residents and later as attending level physicians. I was privileged to have known him starting in 1985 at Mercy Hospital, which is now UPMC Mercy, when I joined the internal medicine residency fresh out of medical school. At that point, as Dr. DeMeza said, he was just beginning his transition away from officially running uh, Mercy's internal medicine program and evolving into more of an emeritus teacher role, but I can assure you he was not retired. He took his teaching very seriously, and I think for the next 10 years or so, uh, he put the same sort of uh, uh, rigor uh, and uh, awareness of the situation into medical students' uh, eyes uh, as he did uh, into residents' eyes, both uh, at that time and uh, previously. Uh, so he was a well-known uh, uh, he was well known for his teaching even after the time that he was no longer uh, internal medicine residency program uh, director. And then over the subsequent years I had the opportunity to interact with him a good bit. And I'm the first to admit that I'm not worthy, uh, so to speak, of receiving the honor to, to speak with you here tonight. In fact, I should probably uh, ask several persons in the, in the audience uh, tonight to chime in with some of their own information and anecdotes and uh, recollections about uh, how Dr. Luparello impacted them. Um, even when I was chief resident and had the chance to work especially closely with Dr. Luparello, it was always my impression that he had doubts about my worthiness, which of course <laughs> caused me to work even harder to please him. Uh, during the last conversation I had with him uh, a few years ago, I mentioned to him that I knew there was no way I could fill his shoes, uh, and he responded very graciously, uh, of course. He said a few nice things about some recent developments in the residency, and I'd like to think he gave me a little bit of a stamp of approval with his comments. 
And even though I realize that he probably could have said little else in that social conversation, it still meant a lot to me then, and it means a lot to me today. In his day, Dr. Luke Barella was able to carve resident ed education in the way that he saw fit to best mold physicians of the future. He wasn't very much encumbered by the volumes of paperwork and other compliance requirements that exist in today's environment. Although some of those requirements have been really beneficial for all involved, not least the patients, the ability for a physician leader to mold young physicians as he sees fit or as she sees fit is a lot more constrained as compared to in the past. Resident education, as Dr. DeMeza mentioned in the past, was predominantly concerned with the scientific and the clinical aspects of medicine. Uh, today it's required that residents also be taught about the medical system as a whole, including healthcare financing and the various medical criteria for patients to receive care in the hospital setting versus the nursing home setting versus the rehabilitation setting versus other settings that didn't even exist in years past or decades past. Not surprisingly, in 2011 and in recent years, residents also receive a lot more education than in the past about medical legal issues because, uh, like it or not, the medical legal environment is one with which all physicians need to be uh, familiar. Another big change, as you alluded to earlier, is uh, the limitation on residents' duty hours. Uh, the resident quality of life experience has evolved a good bit over the years. Uh, as many of you know firsthand, uh, residents used to live in or next to the hospital, perhaps some of you did in, in your day, um, and their work hours were completely ungoverned. Uh, residents uh, sometimes were on call in-house every other night and often stayed up for most or all of the entire 36 hours of their work period and then came back to work the next day. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, today, because certainly valid studies have shown that uh, resident alertness decreases progressively after 18 or so hours on duty. Uh, residents now aren't permitted to work more than 80 hours per week, which of course is no small amount compared to other professions, but nonetheless that seems like a break compared to what it was before. And even that figure is rarely approached. And residents also can't work more than 24 hours uh, consecutively. Now for internal medicine and surgery residents, uh, working long hours was essentially a rite of passage, as many of you also recall. And it was felt to be necessary for residents to effectively learn how to diagnose and manage, manage patient illnesses. They had to spend that much time in the hospital, see that many patients in that much of a crunch situation to, uh, to, to mature in their diagnostic and management decisions. And almost anyone who's done a residency will tell you that some of their most significant learning experiences occurred when, when they were in the hospital, and it was two in the morning, when there was little backup, and they were forced to think through a problem for themselves and thereby make a difference to a patient for whom they are providing care. But I do think today's patients and families can be comforted in the knowledge that the physician who's providing care to them uh, isn't working under extreme fatigue, but it's also true that residents today see a lot fewer cases than they did in years past. Another topic you hear a lot about, a lot of discussion about, and if you're in the hospital, you'll certainly notice it firsthand, is the emphasis on infection control, which didn't exist much in years past. Uh, when I say infection control, I'm referring to physicians washing their hands and gowning or gloving as needed to prevent the physician himself from taking bacteria, for instance, from one patient to the next. That concept of infection control was only in its infancy in decades past. Even into the late 1980s, as I recall, it was a pretty uncommon sight uh, to see physicians enter a room wearing gown and gloves just to examine a patient. Uh, hand washing wasn't the norm, and in fact, even in 2011, Physicians and nurses still have been pretty slow to adhere to the expectation that they wash or clean their hands uh, before and after each patient encounter. And a lot of studies currently peg the rate of uh, hand hygiene now at around 50% uh, or so. So we still have a long way to go in that respect, despite the evidence that shows the benefit to, of that. And the reason that hand hygiene is so important now is that as compared to day, today to days past, there are a lot more resistant uh, bacteria that exist in sick uh, patients. Around 20% or more of hospitalized medical or surgical inpatients are colonized or infected by these resistant bacteria. So while these bacteria have little or no danger to the physician himself, they're a potential large danger to the next patient examined by that physician. And if that physician were to serve as a vector, uh, taking the bacteria from one patient to the next. I remember that, and I'm sure many of you remember that, when physicians used to have blood on their hands after putting in a, a, a IV or intraarterial catheter of some sort, blood on their hands or overshoes after a surgical procedure. It was considered sort of the proud equivalent of wearing a muddy football uniform. 
uh, but those days uh, are long past. You know, Dr. Luparello prided himself as, as a diagnostician, since at least from an internal medicine standpoint, uh, much of the art consists of making the diagnosis, after which the selection of treatment is sometimes a much less complex decision. And he was a superb diagnostician. He seemed to be able to have the patient's diagnosis mostly figured out just from the history and physical exam without any labs or x-rays or other information. Uh, you may or may not know that Dr. Luparello trained in the days when the term subspecialist wasn't really a common concept. So by the standards of today, he wasn't a true subspecialist. But nonetheless, he's the only physician that I've ever known who all subspecialists regarded as a co-subspecialist. Many of them asked him to give an opinion on their most difficult cases, whether they be heart or lung or kidney or GI tract. It didn't matter what organ system or what subspecialty. Dr. Luparello was regarded as a subspecialist in essentially every field of internal medicine, which is amazing and incomprehensible uh, when you think about it today. With the sophistication that you see now of today's CAT scans and echocardiograms and so forth, a lot of physicians have allowed their own diagnostic skills to deteriorate, and of course this has also impacted their ability to train residents to perform comprehensive history and physical exams themselves. Well, Dr. Luparello was a master of the physical exam and the history uh, leading to the physical exam. Anyone who spent any time at Mercy was very familiar with the concept of loop rounds, meaning teaching rounds with Dr. Luparello. The residents would present cases to him, as uh, Dr. DeMeza mentioned, and of course were expected to have read about the patient's various diagnoses and conditions ahead of time. But no matter how deeply the residents had read, Dr. Luparello would elaborate on 10 or 20 or more aspects of the case that had heretofore not been evident to anyone, and uh, it was so impressive. By the way, this was taken in 1988 or 89 or so, and that person with the jet black hair is actually me in, in my, my metro mullet there, but uh, it's <laughs> nonetheless. Uh, so it was really impressive to me uh, when a patient was presented to Dr. Luparello, whom he had never heard about, after which he had synthesized the information into a coherent whole that would cause everybody in attendance to leave the room just shaking their heads in amazement. Medical education today does produce astute clinicians, but the nature of the informational and financial beast means that it's virtually impossible for a single person uh, to have authoritative knowledge of the entire field of internal medicine. But if Dr. Luparello were with us today, for those of you who knew him, I don't think any of us would put it past him to have that uh, realm of knowledge. You know, despite Dr. Luparello as being the voice of authority regarding all things medical, he really didn't exhibit much of an ego. Uh, he could sometimes be very demanding, uh, but his motivation to do so was always in the interest of the patient. And maybe there's a pattern here of the St. Vincent experience uh, giving rise to outstanding physicians of a humble nature. Um, I've had the opportunity over the last 25 years to work on many occasions with Dr. Ross DeMarco, who also received his pre-medical education at St. Vincent. When you're a heart surgeon, as Ross is, you have to know a pretty decent amount about almost every organ system. And it's occurred to me that if I ever had to choose one jack-of-all-trades doctor to treat whatever ailed me, it would probably be Ross. In fact, it would definitely be Ross. Ross can fix your heart or your lungs or your, your aorta and probably your gallbladder and your hernia too. If you don't have a surgical problem, Ross can treat your blood pressure or your diabetes or your pneumonia. And if your medical problems ever did exceed his expertise, which isn't very likely, he'd have the good judgment to admit that and to seek an answer before providing any treatment to you. So uh, I want to recognize Ross, uh, appreciate him being here tonight, and also for his many efforts in uh, making this uh, lecture hall uh, possible. Thank you very much, Ross. The fact that I can call him Ross just amazes me. He was Dr. DeMarco for so long, and I made that leap a few years ago and uh, still say it with trepidation. Um, in Dr. Luparello's case, uh, I did sense that he possessed at least a small degree of disdain, though, for physicians who didn't recognize the responsibility they had in providing patient care. Uh, sometimes it's so possible to get caught up in the scientific aspects and the day-to-day -day grind and the social atmosphere of the hospital that you can forget that the person on the other end of the stethoscope is worried sick about his future, and that he or she is not only important in his own right, but he's also someone's mother, father, brother, sister, son or daughter, and they're all concerned about what you're going to do to help him. For instance, Dr. Luparello asked that we never refer to patients with diabetes as diabetics. 
since that sort of descriptor tends to depersonalize the patient. If you instead use the phrase person with diabetes, that small twist in wording reminds you that it's not the diabetes that's being treated, it's the person sitting in front of you. And Dr. Luparello always remembered that. So in this wonderful new Luparello lecture hall, I know that thousands of lectures will be conducted in the decades to come, and I know that speakers of far greater expertise than I will use this podium. The one thing that I have that they might not is a personal memory of the man himself, Dr. Frank Luparello. Thank you. Thank you.